I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation, intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. Here in the Central Valley of California, the image of grapevines and vineyards are seen everywhere. The metaphors used by Jesus can be seen right before our eyes. Branches that cannot produce any fruit. This seems strange. When you picture grapevines heavily laden with clusters of grapes, but the imagery presented by Jesus is quite accurate. Grapevines can be plagued with fruitless branches that are referred to as sucker branches that often arise from latent buds that grow from underground node positions on the trunk. Should these branches be ignored, they will spread and slowly drain the fruiting branches from the vitality of the vine. It is the responsibility of the vine keepers to continually prune away these sucker branches throughout the growing season in order to preserve the health of the vine. Throughout the year, the vine dressers prune these sucker branches and burn them in large bonfires. Occasionally, during the spring and summer, the smoke of these bonfires can be seen and smelled drifting on the wind. Is it possible for Christians to be ineffective and unproductive in their walk with Jesus? The answer to this question is an obvious yes. It is not only possible, it is a very common occurrence seen in Christian circles. The Apostle Peter warned his readers about this exact possibility in his second epistle. Peter listed several qualities a fruitful Christian must pursue in order to be productive during their fruit-bearing cycles. 4. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The remainder of this episode will explore the sobering possibility that our walk with Jesus can be frustrated by our lack of productivity. Spiritual suckerwood could be draining away our fruitfulness. The Apostle Peter, in his second epistle, shined the light of truth on the whole reason why we endure our fruit-bearing cycles. He said, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. We abide in the vine for only one reason, to know and love Jesus and to grow in the knowledge of Him. Peter wrote that the grace and peace of God will abound in us as we expand our knowledge of Jesus Christ.
Peter's declaration that grace and peace will follow the path of knowledge seems to be a contradiction with the admonition of Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians. He wrote, We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. Paul warned the Corinthian church that knowledge has the ability to puff up with empty religious pride, while love has the power to edify and build up the body of Christ. This is confusing. Either knowledge puffs up with empty religious pride, or it is the path of grace and peace. Which way is it? How do we reconcile this apparent contradiction? The answer to this obvious paradox is found in the various Greek words used in the New Testament for knowledge. The Greek word used in 1 Corinthians is gnosis, and this word is simply translated as knowledge or science. The word gnosis describes the type of knowledge we acquire through study and research. We send our children to school to learn the gnosis type of knowledge. We also read books and listen to sermons and teaching CDs in order to learn this type of knowledge. According to Paul, gnosis knowledge has the power to puff up our human religious pride. The Greek word used by Peter in his second epistle is not the same as the word used by Paul, but it is a compound form of the same word. The word used by Peter is epinosis, and this word is translated as recognition, full discernment, and acknowledgement. Gnosis and epinosis both deal with the learning of knowledge, but epinosis has an expanded meaning that includes a relational application. Let me explain. Epinosis is a composite of two Greek words. They are epi and gnosko. These two words give us a shade of meaning we would not normally see in Gnosis knowledge. The prefix epi has the application of that which is over, above, and beyond the normal path. When this prefix is applied to the Greek word Gnosis, we arrive at the concept of knowledge that is learned over, above, and beyond the normal path of human learning. What kind of knowledge can this be? There is only one logical conclusion that we can form from this question. Epinosis knowledge must be the type of insight we gain from intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's clarify this concept. Let's say a biography existed concerning my life. All people who read the book would have a gnosis type of knowledge of me. But my wife would go beyond this type of knowledge into the insights acquired from intimate relationship with me. This process is the same with our relationship with Jesus. There is knowledge, insight, and a revelation 
reserved only for those who develop an intimate relationship with Jesus. The fruit of righteousness has this concept as its root. We can only be instructed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the degree we allow our lives to be open to Him through a lifestyle of relationship. The true understanding of the righteousness of Christ cannot be taught by book, sermon, or CD. It must be experienced in the light of intimate fellowship with Jesus. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them we might participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Peter continued his epistle by exhorting his readers to look on their relationship with Jesus as an open door into God's divine nature. Several great and precious promises are available to all who participate in the divine nature. One point must be made clear. To understand the doctrinal truths of God's divine nature is not the same as being a partaker. We can only be partakers of the divine nature to the degree we allow God's nature free expression in our lives. This degree of divine experience can only occur through a love relationship with Jesus in prayer, Bible study, and godly deeds. To partake of the divine nature is not a gnosis-type head knowledge learned in Bible school. It is an intimate experience with our loving Savior, nurtured through relationship. In order to clarify the issue, let's be blunt. Nobody can spoon-feed us divine instruction in righteousness. We must acquire these insights from our personal relationship with Jesus. Peter lists eight characteristics that should be developed in the spiritual heart of fruitful saints. These characteristics are faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. These characteristics are nearly identical to the fruit of the Spirit described in the epistle to the Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. We all have read and heard about the fruit of the Spirit, but do we understand the fruit-bearing process needed to mature the fruit of the Spirit? We look on these attitudes as individual characteristics we should seek after. One person may ask God for more faith, while another may pray for more patience. 
This is the wrong approach to seeking the fruit of the Spirit. There is only one fruit produced by the vine of Christ in our lives, and that fruit is the image of Jesus. All the character traits found in Galatians and 2 Peter come from the same vine, and that vine is Jesus Christ. The more we allow the fruit-bearing cycle to reveal the image of Jesus, the more the fruit of the Spirit will manifest. Do not seek after the fruit of the Spirit as individual character traits, but seek the face of Jesus, and these character traits will develop naturally. The Amplified Bible provides an interesting insight into the process needed to develop the characteristics described by Peter. Let's read. For this reason, add in your diligence to the divine promise. Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop virtue, excellence, resolution, Christian energy, and in exercising virtue, develop knowledge, intelligence. Peter, in his own way, indicates that fruitfulness is a process of character development. In order to develop these eight characteristics, we must exercise the seed faith of Christ given at new birth. Peter made clear that we must employ every effort to exercise our faith to develop virtue. And when we exercise our virtue, we develop knowledge, and so on. Faith is the key that starts the engine, and faith is the fuel that drives the fruit-bearing process. The spiritual exercise program presented by Peter puts the famous declaration of Paul into a clearer light. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The progressive revelation of Jesus that reveals the fruits of righteousness in us can only be developed by exercising our spiritual muscle of faith. Now it should be clear that being a disciple of Christ is so much more than doctrinal memorization. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A spiritual healthy Christian is a person who exercises his or her faith to the point that the qualities listed by Peter will grow and increase in strength. Like all good exercise regiments, the core muscles of our central body mass are the key to success. Faith is the core spiritual muscle that gives strength and direction to the other spiritual qualities being exercised. The strength of our core muscles will often determine the overall health 
of our physical bodies. This principle is also true in the spirit. Our core muscle of faith will determine the overall health of our spiritual walk with Jesus. Every exercise program should have a goal. And for the disciples of Christ, our goal is the epinosis knowledge of Jesus. We can only walk in relationship with Jesus through the sweat equity we invest into our exercise program. The Apostle Peter realized the importance of maintaining a solid spiritual exercise regimen because the spiritual health of our faith will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is scary to think that it's possible for a blood-bought Christian to be spiritually unproductive and barren, but it is possible. How much of our Christian religious experience is ineffective and unproductive in the sight of Jesus? This is a hard question to consider, but we must ponder its truthful answer. What is the attitude that can frustrate our spiritual exercise program? The answer to this question can be found in the Greek word used by the translators to describe our unproductive choices. The Greek word is argos, and it is translated as being inactive, lazy, are useless, the shunning of the labor one ought to perform. This definition is painful to consider. Spiritual barrenness is caused by our spiritual unwillingness to exercise our faith in the work of Jesus. We all know what we should do for our Lord and his church, then why don't we do the work? One word answers this question, and that word is lazy. When we shun the work we ought to perform, we frustrate the fruit-bearing process. The author of Hebrews teaches that slothful, lazy Christian attitudes frustrates our ability to inherit the promises of God. Why are we spiritually weak and frustrated? There is only one answer to this question. We are lazy disciples. Don't blame Jesus for your spiritual laziness. In the end, there is only one spiritual fruit produced in our lives through submission to the fruit-bearing process. And that fruit is an intimate knowledge of our Lord Jesus. When we have this type of knowledge, all the fruits of the Holy Spirit will manifest in us because the righteousness of Christ is being expressed. It is sad to think that our lazy religious thinking could blind us to the true relationship found in Jesus. It isn't long before we lose the exuberance of our first days with Jesus and we forget what past sins he cleansed us from. Suddenly, the old lusts that tormented our lives begin to surface again we find ourselves stumbling in our walk with Jesus. We can be heard saying, I tried Jesus once, but it just didn't take. 
These very words is our indictment before God, that our lazy religious thinking caused us to be ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The truth is, we allow our past sins to become sucker branches that erode our walk with Jesus. It is hard to imagine, but we might be dead wood on the vine of Christ. It shouldn't be surprising when we prune ourselves from the body of Christ. That is right. We prune ourselves from the vine of Christ because we separate ourselves from Jesus, not Jesus from us. Now is the time to do some self-examination. Is your fruitfulness in Jesus being frustrated by the lusts of past sins? Should your answer be yes, then some pruning is needed to remove this sucker wood. Act quickly before you find yourself on the funeral prior of this dead world.